citizen. Oh, oh, oh. Out of many we are. We are world citizen. Same vision is for equal rights and justice. For the people, them, what's happening to this beautiful world that we're living in? World citizen, lift up your voice. Welcome. Oh, you know we Welcome to another episode we of the People Powered Planet Podcast, where we each week. We focus not just on the problems of the world, but on solutions, bringing amazing solutionaries right to you uh, so we can begin to see how we can solve these problems facing our planet. And boy, are we facing a lot of them right now. Our world looks like it's in deep trouble. You know, uh, we're facing uh, wars uh, just getting out of control. We're facing uh, ecological catastrophe looming and and no one able to really put the brakes on it. Uh, We see that the... uh, Old system is just uh, exacerbating the problems and tearing us apart. Uh, And we seem to not be able to manage our global commons that keeps us all alive here on the planet. Well, Gary Davis, the founder of all all the things we're doing here in the podcast, the original world citizen number one, uh, he came to an amazing realization that we don't have to keep beating our heads against the wall, begging and pleading the existing governments to reform, to fix themselves, because you can't fix things inside the system in which they were created. Bucky Fuller and and Einstein all said that. You have to step outside of it and create something new. Uh, So since since Gary, you know, what Gary realized is like uh, the founders of of America, when they founded it, they didn't apply to England, oh, please let us be independent, let us have our own government, all that. They didn't go begging and pleading. It wasn't the application for independence. It was the declaration of independence. And that's what Gary did. He declared a government of, by, and for the people of the world. (laughs) He said, does that sound crazy? Well, what do they mean when they said in the declaration, it's the right of the people to institute new government? It was not you and I, folks. So let's start with a little video of Gary. Uh, Gary's grand vision, his grand vision, which will then lead into our speakers. Our speakers are part of the original inventions that Gary was working on even before we had all these tools of the web and the internet for how we the people could could, could govern our world. Uh, so let's let's start with this video of Gary, and then we'll introduce the amazing speakers we have here today. I named my book that because if our country is the world, then suddenly the seemingly impossible problems like saving our planet, environment, become manageable. Here in Vermont, we have town hall meetings. Today, with the internet, we can all meet in the same room, the global room. In the old days, the king was the sovereign, the one who ultimately made all the decisions. That evolved to presidents who were still on top and the rest of us underneath. But now people are realizing that we are all the sovereigns. The ones who create governments and give them power. We don't have to give our power away to representatives who become magnets for special interest money. What if we invent a governing system in which each of us can participate? Not mob rule, but true collaboration. What if we invent world money? Why not? We humans are an incredibly ingenious species. Why squander our genius when inventing smart bombs to do ourselves in? Why not use our great ingenuity to lend SmartGov, a way we can all interactively and intelligently and heartfully govern our communities, our regions, and our world? Visionary, you bet, but doesn't every advance start with imagination? When we catch the vision of a people-powered planet, then, in this era of instant communication, we'll be able to evolve the tools and the platforms we need to bring the highest and best wisdom of each individual to the task of governing planet Earth. Once we tap into the sovereignty of the whole, we can unleash the genius of humanity. End war. End oppression. Solve global warming. 
just a taste uh, of Gary beginning and beginning to develop the tools and platforms we need for us to be able to govern our world and save our global commons. Uh, and part of Gary's, we have with us people who are part of Gary's very original vision in creating this. Um, Gar Gary Davis uh, engaged the services of, of a fellow Buckminster Fuller uh, uh, admirer, follower, uh, Stafford Beer, who uh, uh, who brought in, brought, worked with him to bring in this, in this incredible invention he developed, you're going to hear about today, called Syntegrity. And that was, in the beginning of that, uh, the, a person who was in at the very beginning of that, Stafford Beer, uh, has now left this earth, but his partner in, in both his work and his life, uh, Elena Leonard, is here. And Elena, Elena is the uh, president of the American Society for Cybernetics. Cybernetics means that kind of interactive, almost self uh, correcting system of of governance that can take huge masses of information and make them all work together, like like all the data that that, that makes your, uh, your your GPS get you to where you want to go without having to understand the mechanics. But today we are going to deal a little with the mechanics that they developed in the early stage of that. Uh, so she's the president of the American Society for Cybernetics and the International Society for System Sciences so scientists sciences uh, and. She was the director uh, and, and one of the original people of the Stafford Beer Viable of the Institute that's carrying on uh, Stafford Beer's work in viable system models and teams integrity. Uh, and then David Beatty, David Beatty uh, is the World Integrity Project Coordinator and a founding member of Teams Integrity. Teams integrity. He was part of some of these original uh, integrations and, and can explain them. And, and he's now working with... Uh, uh, the Individual and Organizational Learning Center at UNESCO with their uh, Center for Water and uh, Education and so on in the Netherlands. He's coming to us from the Netherlands. So uh, let me start with, uh, with Alina and ask you if you could maybe share with us uh, a little bit of what it was like to be working with Stafford in the early development of, Sinteg of Sintegrity and also perhaps uh, share a few slides with us that take this complex concept and explain uh, how it was sort of a model for, uh, as you saw in that video, little small groups interacting and those small groups interacting with other groups that were coming to bring out the highest and best wisdom of humanity. What was the system that Gary was beginning to develop that could bring out the highest and best wisdom of a group and uh, bring that into cohesion so that group could come to resolutions of how we should move forward? So, um... First, I'd like to make a minor correction. I'm a past president of both of those organizations. Right. Uh, someone else is president of both of them now. Uh, but in terms of the origins of Syntegration, Stafford Beer was interested since at least the 1970s in how do you get the maximum amount of information sharing so that organizations and people with a common purpose can get the most out of their interaction. And he engaged in several experiments along the way, but remember that uh, from a conversation he had with Bucky Fuller, that Fuller said all systems are polyhedra. So he set upon the idea of using a three-dimensional regular solid as the structure for a meeting where there would be no top, no bottom, and here I can show you uh, an icosahedron. Um, there's no top and there's no bottom, and every edge and every node is equivalent to every other. And out of that came the process that's now known as integration or the team integrity process, which is a process to enable what Stafford called an info set, a group of people sharing a common purpose and wishing to share information and move ahead together uh, to enable such a group to be able to work together most effectively and share the maximum amount of information. This is the how of the integrity process. Uh, the icosahedron is a coherent architecture um, and it has 30, 30 edges, 12 nodes, and it's completely uh, regular solid. And each of those colors represents a different aspect of an opening question that people uh, begin with when they start a integration process. So this is how it works. 
Uh, we start off with thinking in terms of how teams work together. Five people on a topic of mutual interest, and there are two groups of five people, um, and another three, two groups, and now there's six groups of five people. And those are the 30 people who comprise this integration participants. They start off with a three and a half day schedule where in the first phase, it's a kind of a um, brainstorming process that converges on 12 aspects of that opening question. And then the groups all meet in parallel. So the red and the white team are the first, uh, first set of meetings and then the black and the light blue, et cetera. And this is done three times. So that by the end, you have a pretty complete sharing of information. Now, one of the things that we realized in the first experiments is that each of those team, um, team members, so say someone is red purple, uh, that team membership means that they also have two memberships that are also unique as team critics. And the, that was the idea that Stafford had that people should um, not just stay in their boxes, they should have an antithetical management or a critic role that asks them to look at how the process was going, uh, interject any relevant content from their teams or generally just keep the team on track. So this is how we start. Each individual starts writing down a statement of importance, something that they think answers the opening question or is relevant to it. And people are advised early on uh, to not make motherhood statements. <clears throat> if everyone would agree with the statement that's made, it's probably not gonna stimulate much new thinking. When these uh, statements on the board are clustered, uh, people will pick up a cluster that's around a common theme and take that cluster to a flip chart where they can continue to refine and develop that particular area. Now, if you get five signatures on a problem jostle statement, then that means that can go forward as the candidate to be among the 12 topics that are discussed over the next three days. So this is the process where different statements are either combined or chosen so that we go from maybe a, a 24 of these flip chart pages with different aspects uh, down to the 12 that we need to work with on the icosahedron. And you might think that um, that's not, that's reducing a lot of the variety, but in fact, you can generally get almost everything into the 12 topics that are chosen. And 12 is usually enough in the way of topics to get a pretty wide variety of, uh, of input from the different stakeholders. And I should mention that the stakeholders um, are chosen to provide as much variety as possible that's relevant to that particular question. The next stage is people vote on what topics that they are most interested in and their votes are tallied by a computer and people are assigned to their, uh, to their two team memberships, which also imply their two critic memberships. So here's a, an example. Um, this person is a member of the red team and the orange team and a critic of green and dark blue. Um, the person sitting next to them is a member of the red team and the light blue team and is a critic of silver and dark blue. So each person has their particular role. This is what an outcome resolve meeting is. This five team members sit around a table or in our, um, in our ease integration, sit in front of their computers. Uh, a facilitator keeps the process on track, takes notes and pays attention to the timing. Now, one of the aspects of this <clears throat> is that each of those individuals is expected Expected to contribute to the topic and a number of five in a group means it's it's pretty obvious if someone doesn't speak and it's also pretty obvious if someone hogs the floor so that particular group of five is a good group to open it up to everybody to have their input now the critics 
are over there. Uh, there's five critics also. And during a meeting of an hour, the critics will probably have uh, two opportunities to make their points. Uh, the first one after about 20 minutes of the team's discussion and the second one after about 45 minutes of the team's discussion. There are also observers and the observer role is to sit quietly, uh, take it all in and save their comments for their own teams. It should be noted that this process is going to take up uh, 20 out of the 30 people in any given session. So there are, there are 10 observers who are welcome to drop in and listen to any of the topics being discussed, or they're welcome to go for a walk if they want. This is how the outcome resolve meeting looks. This is the red team. And these are the participants in that red team. So you have red purple, red light blue, red orange, red yellow. And all of these people have three other roles. As another team member, um, other than the red team, like red purple, and as a critic of two other teams. So this means that there's quite a lot of overlap in terms of the discussion. The teams after their meeting uh, put together a summary of what they discussed and their conclusions, and that is posted on the wall. And the rest of the people who haven't been in that meeting uh, can come and look at it, what they've done. Um, they're gonna know some of it because topics, um, topics that are discussed have points that reverberate all around the uh, all around the structure and show up in other teams as well. But at this point, this is an opportunity for people to place dots on the ones that they like uh, by way of encouragement, or also they can put comments saying, you know, did you think of this? This is the orthogonal set group, and these are the different uh, team memberships that cover all twelve of the um, of the topics and these individuals who are opposite one another in orthogonal sets are the people who will never be in the same meeting together so sometimes in order to make sure that there is full sharing of information these orthogonal set groups are gathered over lunch or over another offline meeting so that they can share their perspectives a little bit more but these are the people who never meet in a session. So these are the different protocols. Um, it's not always possible to get 30 people together for three and a half days. Uh, so sometimes there are other options. <clears throat> uh, if you are going to not quite have 30 people, you can use the cube octahedron, which instead of having five member teams has four member teams and also discusses 12 topics. Or if you want to, have a, a shorter meeting and a smaller meeting, uh, you can have the octahedron. And that allows people to, 12 people to discuss six topics. So that would be one of the short forms. And I think that's probably all we need to see right now. And I think David has another slide. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Elena, for that. I think that gives us some idea of kind of the, the mechanics that the organizers have behind it and how this all works. I think to the participants in it, uh, it should all go through as a smooth, smooth flowing process where they get to understand each other's feelings and desires and what, they're, what people are aiming at. And they're doing it uh, by focusing on these topics, as you said, rather than who's right or who's wrong. You know, what, what are the, how do we want to solve the problems of the, air, of the pollution in the air? How do we want to create alternatives to the system of, uh, of war and violence in the world and so on? So, uh, I think we're going to move now to David, uh, who's going to tell us a little bit more, uh, da to David uh, Beatty, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the uh, experiencing this early disintegration. And I think the question I want to ask him is, uh, from an ordinary user who jumps into this, you know, all, all those, the struts and all that sounds a little complex, and what's this all about? But what is the experience it like to emerge, be emerged in this? Uh, what does it feel like, and what do you feel like as you're coming together? into a cohesion with a group. If you imagined uh, all of us on this program tonight joining this integration and thought of how different we all are and we're trying to predict how the outcome would be, it would be very difficult to do. 
And that's one of the things about disintegration. Uh, when you bring 30 people together and Stafford found that when he was a consultant, it was two or three dozen people that had to be included to make a decision to really, really happen in an organization. And Elena referred to that as high variety. So our experience with facilitating them was that there are three, three iterations, the groups when they formed me three times and the facilitators whose responsibility is only to follow the process and not deliver any content. At the end of the second day, second iteration, there were many times when we thought, we're, this is finished, it's never gonna work. They've just discovered how many differences and tensions that are going on and how, how are they gonna get out of it? And we can't help them. Uh, so in some senses, there's an incredible tension. And one of the things we were fortunate enough to have was some really top musicians came out of, uh, of the Barbados and uh, we always had a music night. And like any group of 30 people, there are a lot of talents that are available and that seem to get people out of their left brain and a little bit more into the right brain. So there's a, a, a tension and a joy in, in every situation. Um, and what else would I like to say there? Maybe uh, bring in, uh, Lena, Lena mentioned you have an additional slide to share with us. Is that correct? Okay. What I wanted to say about this, uh, in a lead into it, that most of the work we did last century was for large organizations who could afford us. And I'm particularly feeling that I want to thank Robin Lloyd, who's here, because I believe she was a key player in enabling Gary to uh, give us the resources to, to test the Syntegrity Protocol, I think 30 times, and leave a manual. Uh, Wendy Walsh, one of our early players, there's a manual that enables world citizens to know how to, how to do it. And the center of the, what I have there, you see one, one disintegration or one disintegrity uh, icosahedron. And as uh, Elena pointed out, there are five different sets of people who are orthogonal sets. And an orthogonal set means that the six people are in every group. So if, if you were bringing uh, together five orthogonal sets, uh, then they go out to the next ones around, you suddenly have the six people who were in every topic, the center one, go back and invite five other groups of six from their, let's say the first one was a, a country or a region, the one out, out here is uh, five different areas of the region, and then they would go out one more and do five more. So you'd have one five twenty five integrities connected. And so one of the questions you ask a lot, Arthur, is well, how can we degenerate how can we generate enough collective intelligence that we can have an impact uh, at the level we have to do? So as Lennon also said, there's no there's no advantage to, to where you are in, in, in the shape. So you have 30 people who are equal. You then have an, another group of five. That's another uh, 30. So you have 150 people. And if they go one more level down or up, you have uh, 750 people connected in five areas. And that's how I want to show it. Because if we, our goal, the, the veterans, Alain and I are veterans, we met in, in Toronto in October and said, our goal is to get this out into the commons because the world citizen reality is now getting to the point we've got to connect together. And so this is part of the first step in inviting anyone who's interested more to get in touch with David Gallup and see whether we can support the World um, Service Organization in getting its integrity back out to where it's needed. So Very good. That, that's my pitch. Thank you. Thank you, David. I think that, that's excellent. I love your, your, your uh, graphic because uh, if you imagine that, you know, uh, spreading out, spreading out all around the globe, you end up with something that begins to uh, give people everywhere a way of interconnectedly bringing out that, that uh, what Gary called the, uh, well, the, the will of the people as a whole, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the sovereignty of the whole. And that's what he was moving toward. 
Now I want to uh, introduce again David Gallup. He's spoken on our podcast before. Uh, he's the he worked with Gary for for decades and decades. The head of the of the World Citizen uh, Government and the World Service Authority that issues the passports and so on on its, on its behalf. Uh, David, I wonder if you could start out because a lot of this has been very kind of uh, uh, heady and, and, and abstract. Uh, I know that Gary did a, a disintegration with uh, some of the refugee women in Africa at kind of the lowest, considered the lowest rungs of society. I mean, these women don't even have an identity. They're running from things. And yet it was incredible the intelligence he tapped into there. Can you tell us a little bit about that early experience and then uh, how that helped shape what you're what you're doing in the world's integrity project. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Gary, uh, from the moment he uh, gave up his U.S. citizenship and and said, "I'm a world citizen," and we all are, uh, he said, "We as individuals have to get involved in governing our world. We're, we are all lawmakers." And he saw what Stafford Beer was offering and what Team Integrity was offering in this uh, integrity protocol, bringing you know synergy and integrity together to create integrity, uh, that this could be a mass movement to involve us as humanity, us as individuals, part of uh, humanity, to get involved in this central question, which was the central question of the World's Integrity Project, which is how can we as sovereign world citizens govern our world? That was the central question. And what I love about this World's Integrity Project is it really is a grassroots movement to involve individuals around the world, which is what you were referring to, Arthur, when you mentioned uh, especially refugee women in Africa. So I'm gonna share my screen for a moment and show you, uh, well, this is our World's Integrity Project page on our old website. Uh, you can see information about it. You can actually go and see topics that were discussed at the 30 or so um, integrations or meetings that we had of the groups of 30 people in different cities around the world. Uh, but what was amazing about this was that there were people, and you can see, I'd have to maybe uh, make this the screen larger. Uh, let me see if I can do that here. Um, yeah, you can see some of these pictures of people in, in Freetown, Sierra Leone, uh, meeting to discuss how can we, as, as not just Sierra, Sierra Leoneans, but also as world citizens, govern our world. So uh, you can see how it mentions uh, that the mayor of, of Freetown, uh, um, a woman, had said, well, Sierra Leone women will take the lead in Africa. When this was one of the first info sets, which was actually just uh, women, the 30 main participants were all women, uh, empowering women to say, you know, it's not just men or the typical, you know, history of white men governing the world, but we women and women of color have power through this process to say how we will uh, govern the world. So this was uh, pretty amazing. Uh, and I would also refer people back to, um, you know, you can find more information on our old website, worldservice.org, but you can also go to our, our new website, worldcitizengov.org, to find more information. Um, and another thing to mention, <clears throat> in an article that I wrote, I used to have a World Law Now column in, in our newsletter, World Citizen News, and this was from 1996. Uh, I said, integrations can have a, uh, and already have, focused on fulfilling human needs in local and global contexts. For example, a recent integration in Harbu, Ethiopia, focused on health, agriculture, food, and natural resources. Participants there propose many resolutions that respond to basic needs, such as designing a health service policy throughout the world that provides access to free healthcare and medical supplies for all human beings. So the point of, for Gary of this World's Integrity Project and working with, with Stafford and Elena and David and others was to empower us, the people of the world in governing our world. That's the whole point of having uh, uh, tools like a world citizen government as an institution to help empower us all to participate. And I, just another quick quote, and then I'll stop uh, from a letter from Gary uh, to all of our world commissioners from 1992, he said, Bill Perk, our design science coordinator who had worked with Buckminster Fuller on the world game, had written to him in June of 1985 about Stafford Beer, who, and he said he's one of the prime movers who shares with us the conviction that the citizen is the true sovereign and must take initiative to ensure survival of humanity. And now we're taking the necessary steps uh, to bring about a mission control for this planet. Um, and uh, it's this mission control that will help us to develop uh, you know, a system in the, the World's Integrity Project was to develop a system sort of 
creating the ligaments of world law. Gary saw this integrity project or process as helping us to develop, for example, a global flexible constitution, but from the grassroots, from us, the people, not from some you know, academic group or from um, previous laws of, that, that have been written, but really responding to people's needs both locally and how those might be linked globally. And of course, one of the things we didn't get to do in, in you know, 1992 through 1997, when uh, this project was, was mostly being held, was to go online because we didn't have Zoom or, or Google Hangouts or anything like this. But now this process is so much more e easy for people to do, even if they have a mobile phone and they're in a small village in a remote place, as long as they have internet access, we can access this uh, protocol and this process to engage people in answering that central question and how we're going to govern our world. Because right now, it, it, of course, it's not being effectively governed. In, this, in Star Trek, they had a, in the future, a, a, a government in San Francisco, a global uh, world government, and uh, planets, weren't, you know, uh, planets weren't even allowed to join the Federation uh, unless they had a, some way to govern their planet, because then they'd have just chaos and wars and, and you know, not, not be with us very long in that. <laughs> and that's what we're kind of facing. So this is really phenomenal. And David, I love uh, what you said, uh, well, all the different things, but especially uh, about that this, uh, this is something that uh, can give people a handle on, uh, on, 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 and I'd like you to tell a little bit more about that. How can this kind of emerge in this internet era? What is the World Service Authority doing now uh, to begin to develop this into a, a kind of a more interactive tool, bring it into the kind of thing that Gary was talking about, like a smart gov app? I mean, when Garrett, when the internet came along, Gary was so excited because it's like his dream come true. And it's like some of these things that were on paper and took all this complexity and and people to put it together. Now it can almost like happen automatically and seamlessly and we can just get on our SmartGov app and start finding out the questions and things we need to discuss and, and how we can put our input in. And so, so how do you see uh, moving this forward into something that becomes uh, a viable way to do what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says? It says, the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of government. The will of the people, and right now there's no way to express the will of the people at the global level. So how can this be evolved into the kind of smart gov system Gary was talking about, where we can uh, bring to the top the will of the people of the planet? Yes, yeah, I'm glad you asked. World Service Authority is already uh, participating in, in at least three different working groups to develop digital ID that is secure, trustworthy, reliable, accessible by everyone that will allow us to participate in online deliberation and in voting. Uh, so I'm excited about that process. And the fact that I'm in three different groups working on that is, is interesting because I'm learning different perspectives of, of how we could potentially implement uh, world citizen government if, in a macrocosmic way, not just in, in microcosm. So the, having those IDs uh, will help us to, whether it's through the World's Integrity Project and participating in that, uh, or in global voting in, or deliberation in other platforms. We're also, uh, another thing I'm really excited about is, is that we're getting youth involved through development of World Citizen Clubs. We did have clubs running before the pandemic, but that of course, students really were not able to, to meet over the last couple of years. But now as, as students are getting back on campus and all, both in high schools and colleges, we're hoping to engage students also in the world's integrity process, uh, having uh, Sintegrations uh, or meetings on their campuses to discuss how they as youth will participate in governing our, our world. So those are the two ways right now that I think we're going to use this World's Integrity Project and to help uh, engage people from the grassroots. Wow, well, I'd, I'd like to throw it open to questions from people uh, who are joining us here, but I would like to say that digital identity is kind of the core. You know, we've seen how uh, there's been these fake bots and stuff pretending to be people and they've affect elections and other things. And, you know, we really need to know who is really a person. And, and you were, of course, the, at the World Service Authority were the pioneer in creating uh, world identity and the world, world passport. And if this now had a digital component, uh, you know, we can, and, and Gary was the original one who, who invented the idea, let's have world money. And now we're seeing all these cryptocurrencies jumping up. Uh, if we can uh, uh, somehow now is the time it seems like to begin to move uh, this in a big leap forward into the kind of the digital age. Um, 
uh, I don't know if you have a further comment on that or if, uh, if, if David or uh, Elena do, or if anyone in our audience, we want to jump in with questions. But let me let you finish with that, David, and then we'll see if we can open it up. Well, the, the importance of digital identity versus the paper, one, we don't necessarily need to be wasting any more resources producing a paper document. Why not have, if you're having your uh, mobile device or even a, a watch or something, if we can use that to self-identify and to get on, on a ledger like a blockchain that is immutable, meaning you can't change it, it's, it's trustworthy, that would make sense so we can, uh, as people call it, like you st said, Arthur, uh, determine that you know you are human, determine your humanity and identify in, in that way, then we can vote on, on global issues. And why not have, uh, for people who might not be able to have a mobile device, of course, we'll be continuing to produce the world passport, but we also have in the past and will continue to do so, add special features like a QR code so that someone could use both their, what if they don't have a digital uh, um, document or ID, they can use their physical one, but still link it to their digital identity, whether that's for voting or to, access some kind of, like you said, cryptocurrency or account or proof of, of health record or other important day-to-day -day living uh, requirements. Now, you mentioned voting uh, at the global level. And some people say, oh my God, we couldn't have direct democracy at the global level. If we had just votes, then, you know, then China with all their billion people, they would outvote everybody else or, or any other of these large groups that, you know, especially where there's state control. and. Uh, but the key thing about what we're talking about in its integrity here is that it's not just voting. It's something actually much higher and, and wiser than voting. And that is, it's kind of a deliberative process that brings out the highest and best wisdom of each individual, as Gary said in the movie, and amalgamates that into the wisdom of the whole. And so we can't just, we wouldn't just have a mass of people voting one way or the other when they take part in this process. And, they ha and, and, and this process, as Gary and I were talking about it, we realized that now that we have the internet, rather than keeping it localized, the more a, 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 a integrity group uh, is cross-cultural, like it's Arabs and Israelis in the same one, it's, uh, it's people on opposite sides of political issue, the more divergence you had at the start of this integration, the more power you're coming together into a common ground would have in affecting that algorithm that amalgamates all these different uh, uh, info sets into the will of the people at the global level. So it could become a very exciting way where people are reaching out and inviting, yes, okay, you're on the opposite side, we're inviting you to join us because we can come to common ground with this, this technology. Uh, we can have more impact on helping to solve our problems in the world and we can have, have a greater say because you're not saying who's right and who's wrong, you're having a say in what, what are the solutions to the problems that the world's facing. But I also do want to give uh, uh, Elena, a little chance, to maybe just for a moment before we do that, to say what it was like. She, she, you gave us sort of the technical framework, but what was it like to actually work with Stafford Beer when he was working on this? What was it? What were some of the uh, of emotional sides of being a part of someone working on such with him on such a mammoth project of trying to figure out how we can govern our world? Uh, can you tell us a little bit from the emotional side of the story? Well, it was certainly um, inspiring to be part of this, um, but in terms of actually working on it, it was very much of a sleeves rolled up situation because if, as a facilitator and it's sometimes an organizer, uh, you are basically working to help that group succeed from early in the morning until late at night. Uh, but Stafford had many good ideas um, and many, I, many ideas that were oriented towards letting people make their own decisions, um, have their own autonomy. And he firmly felt that the best way to run anything is for the decisions to be made at the lowest possible level so that uh, you didn't have people several levels up who didn't know anything about the situation making those decisions. I just like to give um, one example that David and I were both involved in with the Israeli Center for Research and Israeli Palestinian Center for Research and Information is we had a disintegration on West Bank issues that took place in England. And it was Israelis, Palestinians and members who, who were either expert on various areas like water um, or representatives of the funders. And because they were in a group talking together, they were able to come up with 
uh, situations where they were not at odds. Uh, for example, uh, the Israelis and Palestinians identified an area of Jerusalem that the Israelis did not consider part of Jerusalem and the Palestinians did. Uh, Israeli settlers talked about how they didn't really care who ran the traffic and the sewer system. They wanted to be able to practice their religion, you know, essentially in the shadow of the tomb of Abraham. And so these considerations that they had were quite different. One was an identity religious uh, orientation. The other was a practical orientation. And that kind of uh, is reflected in the title of the book Stafford wrote describing the process called Beyond Dispute, because normally you don't have two opposing sides. Normally you have 30 people uh, who share a number of different priorities, but their priorities are not necessarily oppositional, except in terms of the division of resources. So I think that's that's one of the things, but it was, a, it was a great inspiration to be able to work with Stafford and share in his development of um, some of these, um, of the logistics of some of these processes. He came back to Toronto in 1984, uh, pretty much with this integration process designed and he wrote uh, the first paper about it in 1984, but it wasn't until uh, he and Gary met and and Gary was able to provide the resources to start the experiments that we could actually um, try this process out. So many kudos to Gary for getting this thing launched. Terrific, yes, and to, and to his early World Service Authority for using some of the uh, income from the flood of people applying for passports to help uh, finance all of this. So that was really, really worthwhile. And, um, so uh, I, I love what you said about the Arab-Israeli uh, example because uh, you know the key thing here is that synergy. That, that, you know, one step is voting: which side's right, who's wrong. Forty-nine percent lose, fifty-one percent win, and nobody's really all that happy, and you continue to struggle. Another step above that is trying to come to a compromise. You know, I give up some, you give some up some synergy, which is uh, that you come up with something higher and greater than what anybody who first came into the thing started with. In other words, synergy is a process where it's not one side wins or one side loses, it's together you create something even better and it's something more amazing than you ever even would have started with if you had just tried to say who's right and who's wrong and vote on it. So this is a step forward. Let's go to the questions. Thank you, Arthur. So yes, fascinating, fascinating. This is wonderful. And I loved what you said, Elena, bringing us back to uh, Stafford Beer. Okay, so we do have Anthony. Anthony would like to ask a question. Anthony, go right ahead. Hi guys, thanks everyone. Um, unfortunately, I've got to go in eight minutes and I'm sure I could talk on this for hours. Uh, really fascinating. I'm really interested in what you're doing. Absolutely similar vision to, to the founder, 100%. And just listening then, I think I've been studying John Viveki, Toronto um, neuroscientist for the last 18 months. And he talks about knowledge being the four, four elements of knowledge, propositional, procedural, perspectival, and participatory. And I think almost always most people operate at that propositional level, almost that belief level. And it's not until you get down through those lower levels, especially at the participatory level, that you really know what's going on. And I think that relates to what Alana was, was talking about. So all that fits really well. I'm really interested in the mechanics of that decision-making process. However, the thing that I think there's another layer of complexity that we've got to get into is, and I've only really picked this up and this is really hit home. So I've sort of set a group up over the last three months and I've got five really interesting professors involved. And when you start to learn their insights over decades of work in particular areas, maybe geology, you realize that, you know, we are, everybody's not equal. So everybody's equal in a human worth, but actually in terms of knowledge and understanding that certain things, there's just a level of understanding that we as normal lay people just haven't got and we can't contribute to the same value that these guys can. So for an example, there's a lot of talk out there at the moment and almost greenwashing that oh, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with the environmental problem because we'll go from fossil fuels and we'll go to green solutions. 
But actually, when you really start to understand the geology, there just isn't the minerals to do it. So we have to get down into a degrowth economy. We've got to move in that direction. It's got to be really quick. So if we go to, to you know, do a lot of these synergistic groups, most people are just not going to know about that. And we'll build solutions that actually aren't based on the reality of the situation that we're dealing with. So that's the first point. And the second point is, I think we've got probably eight years left before we've, we've hit all the key tipping points in terms of environmental catastrophe. So we've got to move really quickly. We, I think we need millions of people, millions and millions of people to really influence those power structure changes, which I think is what the original setup was all about. But I don't think we're going to do that through people like us that will get involved in the synergy groups. I think it's got to be huge mass movements really quickly. So sorry, there's two two big points there, but a really interesting group, and I'm really pleased that that people like you exist. So thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that, uh, I, because I think that we do need to uh, turn this into a mass movement, and hopefully, with uh, with the power of media and film and te television, we can help get this out quickly. So. Thank you. Love, love to talk to you after the program. Thank you, Anthony. We appreciate you. And, and thank you, Arthur, for that comment. Yes, eight years. We have to focus. We have to focus. All right, let's go to Michael. Michael, you're next. Oh, that's, that was great comments. And I want to follow along the same thread uh, as he was discussing, you know, taking it down to a degrowth economy, taking it down to a, a sustainable local villages, which is so incredibly important for the developing world. And I think what, what it's going to take is uh, uh, quite a bit of education and a technology transfer from the Northern Hemisphere, basically to the South, to get uh, the technology in a, you know, with the Starlink system up and being able to provide uh, broadband internet across the globe is uh, virtually uh, within our grasp, thanks to uh, well, competing, unfortunately, competing projects between Bezos and, uh, and uh, Blue Origin. But anyway, so let's assume for a moment, if we have worldwide internet access, then we need a, a, a long, uh, in, I think the sustainable development goals is the format in which to launch it, which the United Nations has done a tremendous amount of work with, which globalcitizen.org is very good at uh, spreading the word about the sustainable development goals. If we can take this big technology transfer and get devices and training and technology down to villagers, down to uh, people in poverty around the world, which will teach them and train them, give them the tools about the best energy systems, food systems, uh, construction systems for sustainable villages. And uh, the, Arthur, the next guest uh, you should have soon is a gentleman from Stanford uh, with the Regen Villages, who has a complete software package to run villages top to bottom and every aspect of what I just said. It, this is such a solution because you can take all the resources that are local to you and you can have a lot of people thrive and live in a very sustainable way. So that along with the global peace movement, of course, the mass movements, I think we could get to the point where the, the gentleman was just saying that we can, we've got to accelerate decarbonization. We've got to accelerate degrowth and all these material goods, which are in, in large part not necessary to continue to produce on such a massive scale. So it's really exciting to see Starlink coming to pass. And, you know, all these secondary devices we have, you know, our old iPhone, our old iPad, you know, transfer all of these to people who have nothing so they can get the training, they can get the knowledge. Because I remember that one story real quick, that this young man in Nigeria who got access to technology and he, he built a windmill out of scrap parts and he started producing his own energy. And so it's just, these are entrepreneurial people that, that need us to share what we have and, and do it quickly. Yes, and from our panelists, do you have any uh, response or comments to what Michael had to say? Um, I'd like to mention one, uh, one comment is that many people in these um, less developed areas have a number of frugal technologies. And Michael mentioned the windmill. There are also water purification, passive solar, any number of them. So a lot of it is taking what we've got and spreading the word. And finally, I'd like to mention that it's really difficult uh, for people to understand all the technical aspects, uh, but storytelling to get people emotionally engaged in a better planet and a 
a better use of our resources really is the way to go. And telling stories is something that we have to get a lot better at. Mm, yes. Now, David Beatty, go, go right ahead. I just want to also underline that the, with World Citizen, there's also the term uh, Spaceship Earth crew member. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not only deciding uh, how you want to rule, it's learning how to work together to get things done where you actually live. And Buckminster Fuller uh, and Safford, uh, and I'd like to mention also Bill Perk from Carbondale, who was a good friend of uh, Bucky, he found us first and he jumped in and did a lot of integrations with us. So the crossover between all the intelligent old folks <laughs> who weren't so intelligent when we started, we need to find a way to partner with the incoming generations to not, uh, not think like we did because <laughs> we don't have a pretty good track record for where our thoughts have brought us. But nevertheless, uh, my, I have my grandfather's beads on here from, uh, he was born in 1880. And uh, if the next generation coming in will go to the 22nd century, we are in the middle, we are in the middle of a big moment. So let's all just pitch in and have fun. Thanks. Um, I love that. Um, actually, David Gallup, you have to jump off. Did you wanna say some parting words before you, you take um, off? No, I just, I do want to hear what Peter has to say, and then I'll, ju I'll oh, okay. jump off. But I was just going to, just to follow up on, on all, every, all the, uh, Michael, Elena's, and David's comment, is that we need to be looking towards uh, Indigenous communities for what they're doing to live sustainably, um, whether it's the windmill or something else. And, and I, think, I don't think that uh, national governments have, have at all done that en enough. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, David Gallup. Thanks for being here. We'll let you go as soon as Peter asked this question. Now, Peter, we'll go to you. Thank you. Um, and good to see you all. I, uh, I come from a background of, of Bucky Fuller, if uh, you haven't met me before, and, and worked on uh, the Global Energy Grid proposal for the last 30 years uh, to link renewables around the world. It was the number one strategy from the world game. Uh, so several of you have said, uh, Bucky had a strong connection with, with Stafford, and I know with Gary. Uh, uh, what we wanted to do was with the Sim Center, Arthur, you know, downtown, we wanted to uh, um, have that be an ongoing, ongoing dialogue every day, all the time. This question of the world game, how do you make the world work for everybody sustainably? Uh, that's really the, the essence of the world game question. Uh, a quality of life for everybody in a sustainable way, right? And uh, that, uh, that's different for people in different parts of the world, of course. Um, but I didn't ever really connect with uh, the cybernetic community and figure out how to, how to, how to dramatically share that information in a way that, that Elena maybe talked about and, and David uh, in, that, in that fashion where you have multiple groups of people meeting around the world uh, for the betterment of everybody at the same time globally and locally. So that for me would be the, you know, how, do, how, do, how do I take the work that I do in the world game in a, in a immersive visual environment? That's where, we, it was interesting. I think it was Elena in your graphic presentation, or I don't know who ran that maybe, or who created the graphic. And you saw the group of people around the table then interacting with one group on a screen. And then there was a second group on a screen. And very, very finally, it was, uh, uh, that one group with half a dozen screens all the way around the room interacting. Um, that was our goal with the Sim Center. How do you have that? How do you have that face-to-face -face communication with people around the world and in the room at the same time? Um, there's a value of seeing each other eye to eye that goes beyond beyond this. And so I know the um, I'm sure the work of the synergetic process was extremely valuable because it put those people in a room for three days in a row. Uh, and magic happens when you do that. But it's for the 30 people in the room. It's not for the you know, 3 billion or 7 billion around the world that need the result. I don't know if there's a question there, but that's, you know, I know, I know Bud has played the world game many times uh, uh, in Aspen. 
maybe others of you have as well. Um, it essentially is a large scale board game where we all become participants on the world and we're given different resources because different resources are allocated in the world. Some people have lots of money, some people have none, some people have lots of food, some people have very little. Uh, and you play it out usually on this di large Dymaxion map for a day, but it's a one day experience. It needs to be a, a, an experience that people live and work and ask that question all the time. Mm. Thank you, Peter. And uh, David Gallup, we'll go to you for- just, Yeah, just a final comment before I head out. Thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, but to comment to Peter's point, one of the goals which we actually um, implemented throughout this integrity project was to give the collated statements of importance, that is the those whittled down to 12 statements or whatever it was out of each group of 30 people of how we could start to govern our world. We would send those statements to the next set of people meeting the next 30 people in another city. So there be, became the synergy uh, and, and an understanding of what other people were already talking about in other cities. So they could see what people had already uh, talked about, comment on that and bring those ideas into their own groups. Uh, so the process was one that was continuing and it was shared not just among the 30 people, but every other group that, that saw it. And if we had continued the project, we would have you know thousands and thousands of statements now that would pertain to how we should be governing, governing our world. And of course, uh, the next pro uh, step in the process is to implement all of that. But I've got to go and maybe yes. maybe Elena and David could talk more about the implementation of, of those uh, statements that come out of the uh, protocol. But anyway, thanks everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, David Gallup. And you can reach, uh, if you have any other questions, it's info at worldcitizengov.org. You can reach David Gallup there. And uh, yes, go ahead, Elena or David Beatty, you're, you want to add something to that? And then we'll go to Tom. I would like just to say quickly that uh, Syntegrity is a very good learning system. Uh, you have 30 people, each one of them is unique in the sense that they are in four groups. Mm. You have 12 teams that are focusing on a topic and, and connecting with the other 11 and you have the outcome of the whole group. So in terms of an educational opportunity space, since the knowledge that people bring can be shared in the library afterwards, and we have the ability to tell the story of what happens through the phone uh, films we have, and we have uh, the opportunity to vote and connect our currency to what we decide, that you in fa fact can design what you're doing as continuous improvement. And uh, so many people who are in universities, I'm saying this particular students, you're in many different faculties in silos already. The students are the ones that are taking courses in all different areas. And I think like the ISEC student groups uh, can in fact, get a huge bonus by connecting all their learning. And I'd be very interested in exploring that further if anyone would like to uh, uh, hook up with me. Thanks, that, thank Great. you. And uh, uh, you could use the same email I just said uh, to get a hold of David Beatty. Elena, did, were you saying you wanted to say something? Uh, one thing I wanted to quickly mention is that there's a real opportunity for production here with respect to disintegration, because disintegration takes three, three days, three and a half days, and nobody's gonna sit there and listen to three and a half days worth of discussion, which you couldn't anyway, because the groups are meeting in parallel. But what could be done is if disintegrations were recorded, it would be possible for an editor and a producer to produce a one hour or a one and a half hour synopsis of that particular disintegration so that that could be shared with others hmm. and they wouldn't have to um they wouldn't have to struggle with it because there's an awful lot of you know kind of getting a you know finding their way to the topic finding your way to the conclusions which is necessary uh but rather you know rather than have to absorb and integrate all of it um an editorial process could make some of those examples uh, very clear to people and 
basically be a form of storytelling. Mm, yes, yes. Um, yes. Let's go to Tom. Tom, go right ahead. Well, I was just going to say go to Margaret first. Oh, <laughs> Margaret, you're first. <laughs> I just want to add, I have been facilitator in, I think, almost 50 integrations and uh, international and national most in the Netherlands. Well, there's a lot uh, talk about information sharing, but my inf uh, observation is that one of the big pr uh, pr products of this integration is that people learn to listen and to enjoy, to uh, be open for uh, people who think differently. So it's not only harvesting from the diversity, but internally you, you get a atmosphere of, oh, uh, that person is different. So, and uh, David said something about learning and I would like to highlight this a special effect, um, uh, I, I hope, Elena, you recognize that too, that, that the hard component is 50% of this integration and the intellectual info is the other one. So I would like to highlight that as a very, for me, a very dear aspect yeah. of this integration. Yeah, thank you. That that's a very important point, and and we didn't stress it enough. But another big outcome of these events is that people form bonds, and many of them continue after the event uh, because they have shared a, an experience and they've got something in common. And besides their interests, they also learned about each other personally. I love that. That's. Beautiful, that's beautiful. Okay, let's go to our last question. Tom, go right ahead. I just wanted to say that everything that we're doing, I mean, Authors Podcast, it's amazing. It's all part of all of us uh, organizing in our own little ways as becomes a larger organization, larger organization. And with the technology that we have today, it's a lot easier than it was in the 60s holding up placards, band, you know, uh demonstrating against the vietnam war okay this is so much easier and for myself i've sort of targeted a new group that i'm approaching on a platform called discord which if nobody's heard of it i want you to look it up the platform of discord and i encourage arthur and melanie to look at it as well and my target audience that <laughs> i'm reaching out to oddly enough is people call gamers. Now, gamers aren't somebody playing some little ping pong game that we used to play. These are very, very sophisticated. I don't even call them games. But the fact is these people, there's thousands and thousands of them organized together on Discord. Okay? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, here we have a podcast and we have millions of podcasts just like this like-minded podcast, okay? They're reach, going, trying to reach out for the same goals uh, as what uh, the guests here today have expressed. I'm all for it. And the other key point I wanted to say is, and I know many of you are already involved with the youth. The youth is where it's at, because if you take a screenshot of all of us, except for a few of us, we're all old farts. Okay, excuse the expression. And uh, we are planting seeds in the youth that is going to continue on when my eight year old grandson is 90. Perhaps we will be living in a different time zone, uh, not time zone, but you know what I'm saying. So I encourage everybody to reach out if there aren't reaching out to the youth. I, my my little show called The Dude Show uh, last uh, uh, night, had, well, you know, we have over 500 visitors and we just started, people that come online and inspection on the uh, Twitch show. So I'm just saying, you know, we, we each need to be reaching out to the youth. My target became the gamers because they're incredibly intelligent people mm -hmm. and they're using uh, technology to organize. I was going to say, wait for it. I usually say, wait for it, organize. 
and they're doing this on Discord. And what all of us are doing here today with this show, with Arthur's show, is we're organizing a little bit at a time, okay? And, you know, uh, without the youth, forget about it. I mean, I want to see more youthful faces on this. I've been with this. How many shows have you done, Arthur and Millie? 500, 300? Well, it's two years worth, okay? Yeah. And I've been there yeah. from the very beginning, from the very beginning. And I'm just saying, I want to, I would love to see, like, the youth that are on here today. When I say youth, if you're 50 and younger, you're wow. youth. Well, I, I feel pretty young, and I would say, I would say that we want to, yes, I totally agree with you, Tom, but um, we should uh, any, so, so, let so our guests ahead. go. Yeah, well, it's about that time. Um, thank you for your comments on Discord, because, yes, I love Discord. There's so many great platforms, and we are converging, and there is a lot of hope. There is a lot of hope, and I'm so excited that you're all here working on this. This is fascinating subject and now we're going to go back to arthur arthur take it away thank you so much tom for that and speaking about youth uh i noticed that uh, uh alina's daughter is here Ar ariel right uh, i wonder if she wants to uh, uh comment as a as a uh, uh it's so, so great that you've inspired a, another generation to take an interest uh are you able to uh, unmute and make a comment and i've been kind of dabbling uh in the uh, mostly International Society of System Science uh, for years now. I attend some of the conferences and I've presented. So um, I work for the Forest Service in Arizona. Wow, very interesting. Well, we'd love to have you with our podcast more. Maybe you can help us as, as we design system sciences going on. Yes, very important to be passing, uh, uh, getting young people more involved and very important to be jumping out into these larger platforms as as. Uh, Tom has mentioned getting hundreds and hundreds of people. We have a great opportunity next week for you all to help with getting this out wider. That little excerpt you saw at the beginning of Gary talking about how we can have these interacting groups evolve into SmartGov for the planet, that's part of our film, The World is My Country. And we have an amazing opportunity now. Uh, we already had it out on 100 public television stations across the country. And now we have an opportunity to have it not only, again, a repeat on some of those stations and other PBS stations, but at the same time, also to have it out on Link TV. And it goes out on Direct TV and Dish Network, as well as in the online. Uh, and so next week, we're going to be inviting you to join us in a working party to do exactly what one of our questioners said. You know, we've got eight years. We've got to move quickly. How do we, how do we jumpstart this into the mainstream? And it's not going to happen, you know, one little uh, podcast like this at a time. But if, it, with the power of film and media, if we can get this kind of story and this vision out there and get young people fired up and working on it, uh, we can start to have a big impact. And, and uh, Martin Sheen has called on us to actually start a series based on Gary's book, uh, My Country is the World. And we have a couple of proposals out to do that. We're working to bring people together. So you can hear about all of that. And you can hear about more about doing this work if you come join us next week. Uh, that's the same time, 10 o'clock Pacific. And uh, we would love to have you all join us in that uh, as we work together to, uh, to try to bring in sponsors. Think about uh, some of the companies or organizations that may have some funds who would jump in to help sponsor getting this out on TV and getting their names out there uh, before millions of people and their product out there. Uh, uh, associated with a film that's attracting just the right demographic for people who are trying to reach a world audience. So please do join us next week. And then take a look at the amazing past speakers. Go to peoplepoweredplanet.com. That's a shortcut cut which takes you to the theworldismycountry.com forward slash club. And there you'll see some great, great speakers uh, that we've had over the years and exciting visions for how we come together as a planet. So join us there and every week on the People Powered Planet podcast. And now before I close, I want to give our guests one last chance to give not only a closing comment, but how people can follow up and get more information from them or see their websites. You want to start with David? Yes, I just want to say, Arthur, that I finally see you as the, the world Santa Claus. <laughs> You've been a Santa Claus, I think, in the Los Angeles area for many years. But the gifts you are distributing now are really big time. And thanks for staying uh, true to your 
Gary, and your journey. So that's that's all I want to say. And you'll find me on uh, World's Integrity Project uh, space on uh, on David's site. So that's that's me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, any other last word uh, from you, Elena? Uh, well, mainly I would just like to thank you and David and Melanie for putting all this together and to say that if anybody wants to reach me, they can reach me through the info at. I'd be happy to receive any, um, any messages that someone wants to send. Appreciate everyone joining us. Thanks for being a part of another episode of the People Powered Planet Podcast. See you next week. World citizen, lift up your voices. Oh, you know we got something to say. All we need is the same directions, heading in one way. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel and like this video.